Um, so this video is about chapter 13, technology and price of healthcare. Uh, this chapter, we are gonna talk about healthcare costs and how technology has played a role in driving the co cost up. We're also gonna talk about healthcare production in terms of technology and wh when will technology overuse happens and when will waste or overuse of medical resources happens. So that would be the focus of this chapter. So we all know the healthcare costs are rising. Um, it has increased faster than inflation for decades until recently that, um, until recently, 2022, that we had a major inflation in energy and other price. Um, healthcare costs have increased faster than inflation before very recently. So in 1960, a typical American would spend one, $1 per $20 of their income on medical care. Um, in 2010, this number becomes one in every $6. And in 2020, um, which is today, 2022, um, roughly one in every $5 is spent on um, healthcare. Here is a graph that we've seen in chapter one um, that we can see healthcare expenditure as percentage of GDP has increased all the way from 5% in 1960 all the way to 16% in 2008. Um, the solid line is GDP as billions of dollars. Okay, so healthcare expenditure as a proportion of US GDP has been continuously growing. When we talk about healthcare costs, we are talking about total health expenditures. So to sim simplify that, we have one equation that can categorize all of it. That is expenditure equals to price times quantity, okay? So when we are thinking about rising expenditure or rising E, we can simply just div divide that into rising P and rising Q. Okay, so on the one side, the rising Q has happened. Um, the quantity demanded has increased. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna talk, talk about that in, in several demographic perspectives. Um, on the other side, um, prices or P has increased as well. Okay, um, and at the same time, we have more and more technology innovations, and um, at the same time, technology overuse happens, um, even though technology has improved people's life expectancy. So the rest of this chapter will focus on each of these hypotheses, quantity, prices, and technology, innovation, and overuse. Okay, so first, let's take a look at quantity. Um, we have a larger quantity or growing quantity of medical care or healthcare that we consume. That is because we have an aging population. Um, our population has become older and older people consume more healthcare. We also have a wealthier population, um, which means that people will have more money to spend on improving their health. Um, we have more insurance coverage. This doesn't mean um, increasing demand or increasing quantity directly. But as we mentioned in the previous chapter that because of moral hazard, um, when people are covered, they will likely use more healthcare. So more in insurance coverage also means more quantity. Um, the next part is increasing quality of medical care. Um, this one is um, talking about marginal utility of getting healthcare. So if marginal um, uh, utility or, or the, the dollar, each dollar spent on healthcare generates a higher quality, uh, generates a higher utility, um, then people would like to increase their um, healthcare quantity or consumption so that that marginal, con uh, marginal utility matches with the marginal utility from, from other goods. Okay, so that is one aspect. Um, the other aspect is that new types of healthcare have come into existence. Um, before, we don't have a 
treatments for a lot of different diseases. We also have new diseases and we have find new treatments and new ways to treat um, old diseases, new diseases. So um, those can also increase the quantity uh, of medical care consumed. Um, on the other side, prices may be rising because of first increased resource costs that it's simply just getting more expensive to produce um, certain type of healthcare. Um, second is less competitive market. Um, in the previous chapter, we know the hospital is a very um, monopolistic or a market that is not competitive enough. And actually in healthcare in general, um, hospitals mergers or other forms of merging have made this market more and more monopolistic over time. Um, the third part is more expensive new technologies. So if more than medical care routinely incorporates new expensive technologies like MRI machines, the price of treating many ailments will rise. Okay, so the last part um, here is a uh, data for that. So number of MRI and CT scanners um, in all of these countries, uh, mostly developed countries, United States have a higher amount of MRI than all the other countries back in 1997 and also in 2007. And most countries have experienced um, a growth between uh, a growth from 1997 to 2007. Okay. So um, here, here is is we we wouldn't necessarily think of this as a bad thing because the spread of MRI machine might help people to identify the disease better. Um, the spread of CT scanners, radiation therapies may help people um, to identify disease um, more accurately earlier and so that eventually improve people's health or life expectancy. So we wouldn't think of this um, spreading or adoption of technology necessarily a bad thing. We are just explaining that this is a way that um, technology adoption can drive prices up. Okay, um, when we think about how to measure medical inflation, uh, we need an index. So just like inflation of all the other goods, we have a medical care CPI. This medical care CPI measures changes in the price level for medical goods and services. It can tell us how much more it costs this year to buy the same things we bought last year. Here is a graph of CPI of all goods, medical care, and clothing. Um, in the last 30 years, we've seen medical care CPI remain consistently higher than overall inflation. So the medical care is the line on the top, um, while the solid line in the middle is all goods. So we can see that medical, medical care CPI fluctuates as um, all the other goods, um, but at the same time, it remains higher than all the other goods until very recently, until 2022, until all the other goods becomes a little bit out of control. Okay. Um, to have another perspective, we can see that um, CPI for closing is actually decreasing and it's actually below zero. That means it's getting cheaper to buy closing year over year, while um, all the other goods are getting more expensive and medical care is getting even more expensive in a faster pace. Um, we need to figure out how to calculate medical care CPI. First, we have to create a bundle of goods and services. This is the, this is the same step when we calculate CPI for all the other goods. We have to create a bundle first. Um, this bundle should um, represent a typical or an average American that, um, uh, that we, we wouldn't say a typical American um, because a typical American um, could be healthy, right? But we wanna think of an average American 
and an average American would consume um, several different types of medical care in, um, in a fractional way. Okay. All right, so then next so we will compare the total cost of this bundle year over year by multiplying it with the price. Okay, so here is the equation. We assume that this bundle would not change over time. So in time zero and time one, we have the same quantity zero A and the same quantity zero B. This is the quantity of goods A and goods B in the bundle that persist across years. However, um, for two periods of time, we have different set of prices. Okay, we, we assume that this bundle stays the same, but the price is, is changing. So yesterday's price of A and B are P0, A, P0, B, while today's price are P1, A and P1, B. Okay, so we basically get expenditure of today divided by expenditure of tomorrow. Okay, so here is an example. Um, suppose the bundle is three MRI and two CT scanners. This should stay the same across different years, but uh, prices of MRI and CT scans are different for 2010 and 2011. We'll get the total expenditure in 2011 and then divide it by the total expenditure in 2010. This um, index is 1.275 as we as we want to know how much the price have increased. So we minus one and times 100%. And so we get 27.5%. Okay. Um, if eventually we need a CPI index, okay, so that we can compare it over time. Um, but CPI index is not perfect. It's not a free lunch. Um, the problem with that is technological change. Suppose yesterday we use MRI to detect a certain type of um, a certain type of disease, but this kind of disease um, ha will have a new technology in the future that is better than MRI, more accurate, faster, or cheaper then we don't want MRI anymore, which means we have to remove MRI from our bundle. This is extremely difficult to, to do that because an average American's consumption of medical care is difficult to calculate, while at the same time, we don't know if price is changing that or, or the technology is changing that. Okay, so technological change is one reason why there is some problem with the CPI index. Um, I'll give you another example. That is this disease called Hodgkin's um, disease. So in 1950, there is no cure for this disease. Only 50% people will survive. The rest of people will die. We think of this treatment as non-existent. So the quantity of that treatment in 1950 is zero. Okay, we don't have this treatment yet. We have that in 2013, but suppose we want to model that economically in 1950, we think of it as quantity equals to zero in 1950 because no one uses it. It doesn't exist So quantity is zero. Um, so then how much is the price? We think of it as infinite, even though it doesn't exist. It should not have a price, but we modeled it as infinite so that no one can afford it. So that quantity is zero. Okay. So it's crucial to understand this setup, even though it sounds a little bit intuitive, un unintuitive. Um, you might think, oh, what do you mean by it's not existent, but it has a price. Um, economically, we think of that if it's non-existent, then quantity, we model it as zero and we model the price as infinite because no one can afford it, even though in reality, it's because it doesn't exist. Okay. Um, in 2013, the cure become available. Now we have a price and we have a quantity. 
the price becomes 50,000. The quantity is whatever quantity that we observe people consuming it. So we can think of this price of the Hodgkin's cure that has fallen dramatically. If you want to put this two set of price and quantity into our CPI, you're going to get a CPI that equals to zero and it will not make any sense. Okay, so that is one reason why CPI is a useful index, but it doesn't depict the whole picture. So Cutler 1998 think that we need something else to show the full picture. And the something else would be a cost of living index. So cost of living index can take into account both cost and life expectancy. For example, if cost of living an extra year increases, then patients are worse off. However, if cost of living an extra year decreases, then patients are better off. They use an example of heart attack and they use the technology from 1984 to 1991. And they find out that the cost of living is actually declining even though it gets more expensive. So how do they do that? Um, here is a graph for their paper. In, from 1984 to 1991, life expectancies of uh, heart attack patients increases from five year and two months. Okay, five, two over 12 means five years and two months because, because you cannot have 5.2 years. Um, you wanna have five years and several months. Okay, so it increases from five years and two months to five years and 10 months um, over this time period of, uh, over this period of time. At the same time, cost is increasing as well. Cost in 1984 is 11,000, but cost in 1991 becomes almost 15,000. Okay, so you are thinking of two different things that happened at the same time. First, this technology is improving. People can live longer. At the same time, it's more expensive. So which one is faster? Which one is slower? Are people better off or are people worse off? Given the money that they spent, um, how much of that money, how much of the same amount of money can convert into life that, that these patients with heart attack can survive? So we come back to their conclusion. They find out that, oh, the price actually increases slower than the life expectancy, which means that one extra dollar that, or one extra thousand uh, dollar that's spent on heart attack patients actually increases the, price, uh, the, the life expectancies or cost of living an extra year of life decreases. And they find that that's a 0.5% annual decline, which is 3.4% cheaper throughout this period of time. Okay, so, so Cutler, this paper, argued that we should not just look at the price. We should not just look at how much it costs to treat a heart attack patient. We should also look at how much um, patients can, can live if the growth of life expectancy is faster than the growth of the cost, then we should think of patients are better off. They are getting more, better technology, even though it's getting more expensive, but their health outcome increases even faster. So that is a better situation or a better outcome for uh, the general welfare of the society. Um, there is no doubt that there is technology overuse in um, today's healthcare. So that is our last hypothesis. Um, we will discuss this in a very detailed way. Um, we know that there are lots of medical innovations in the, in the recent decades. Um, we want to ask, can the introduction of more and more expensive technology explain the rising healthcare costs? And if so, are these technology being used efficiently? 
or is there evidence that the technologies are overused? So here um, we'll introduce a new study that's called Dartmouth Atlas. This is a research project that a few bunch of researchers are, are working on, and they collect data to track Medicare spending across the United States. So Medicare, here we met, when we talk about Medicare, we're talking about um, mostly people above 65. Okay, so this project will focus on people who are relatively older, and these patients with the same diagnosis code, do they get the same technology, the same treatment in different places? Do they spend the same amount of money? Um, in fact, they find out that um, even though they have the same diagnosis, what they receive can be dramatically different depending on where they live. And in general, there is no correlation between a more expensive treatment and better health outcomes. So how do they do that? They find a bunch of patients above 65. They, people above 65 have all different kinds of disease and it's documented with diagnosis code. So they focus on people with the same diagnosis and they find out that, oh, these patients are getting different treatment across the United States. And some places they get a lot more treatment, some places they get less treatment. But ironically, um, there is no correlation between how much they spend and how well their health outcomes are. So you would think, oh, if some places people get more treatment, they should be healthier. And the researchers at Dartmouth Atlas find out that that is not the case. So they want to figure out, are those people experiencing a technology overuse? Okay, so more about, more about this spending. Um, Medicare expenditure on patients in their last two years are extremely high. Think of people who live, let's say 80 years or 70 years. Um, throughout their life, they would go to hospitals, they would go to different health cares, but most of their spending, which is 32%, of that budget is spent on thirty uh, is is spent on the last second year uh, last two years of their life. The researchers at this project find out that this number is dramatically different across the space. In some places like Miami, Florida, it could be eighty three point five k, while an average bill in Wisconsin La Crosse is only thirty seven k. And they also find a huge variation in spending even within the same city. So within Miami, some people can spend a huge amount. Some people can spend relatively less. While um, in Wisconsin lacrosse, it's also a huge variation. They want to figure out why is that? Despite these variations, they find out that they have similar self-reported health status and mortality rates between high expenditure regions and low expenditure regions. Um, so that is very unintuitive and ironic because people who end up spending much more money does not become much more healthier. So then we can easily, as economists, we can easily think of it, are those a ways of money? Is this an evidence of wasteful spending. So before we could get to the conclusion, we have to model that first. Okay. Um, we modeled it as a health production function. Okay, so here we have two cities, La Crosse and Miami. We observe that they have the same level of health, okay. Um, so horizontally, they are on the same line. Um, this horizontal line uh, points to a level of health on the y-axis. Okay, um, they have the same health, but they have different health expenditures. Miami, Florida spends much more than lacrosse. So that's why Miami, Florida is at the right-hand side of lacrosse. Now we wanna model health production function. This health production function plots relationships 
between expenditure and maximal level of attainable health. It means if I spend this amount of money, what is the best health outcome that I can achieve? Or what is the most effective um, way of spending money so that I can achieve a certain level of health? We have two hypotheses about this one. Suppose um, there is only one health production function. That means spending a certain health, uh, spending a certain amount of money will achieve a set, a, a some level of health. Okay, so let's look at the left panel. We have one health production function. This production function plots the relationship between money that you spend on health expenditure and the highest health that you can achieve by spending that amount of money. If you spend little money, you can see that increase a little bit money can increase health by a lot. If you spend a lot of money already, then spending an extra amount of money, an extra unit of money doesn't increase health a lot. Um, this is very similar graph to a lot of other graphs in economics. We know that there is diminishing return. We, we know that there is diminishing marginal return to spending of health expenditure. In this case, La Crosse, Wisconsin is on the line, which means that it's using all the money efficiently to produce um, the highest amount of health that it can produce. And it managed to produce that much. So La Crosse is efficient. Then in this case, Miami is not efficient, okay? It could be achieving the same level of health for much lower expenditure, or it could achieve a much higher amount of health with the same amount of health expenditure that they spent. Okay, so that is hypothesis A in figure one, figure A. Our second hypothesis here is a different um, health production function hypothesis. In this hypothesis, we are assuming that Miami and La Crosse are both trying their best in producing the level of health that they could. La Crosse is on um, the health production function of Wisconsin. Miami is on the health production function on Florida. Both of them are on the most efficient point. It's just, it's just that in these two states, it costs differently to produce the same level of health. Okay, if so, variation in spending does not necessarily represent a wasteful spending or technology overuse. Okay, so why do we need to model these, these things in, in uh, graph A and graph B? Because we wanna come to a conclusion of whether there's an evidence of wasteful spending. If hypothesis A is valid or is validate, then there is wasteful spending in Miami. If hypothesis B is validated, then there is no wasteful spending. It simply just costs a different amount of money to produce efficiently at the same level of health. Okay. So what might be the reason that Miami and La Crosse have different health production functions? Here are five different theories for that. Theory one is that there is different input cost. Um, so they believe that different locations have different cost of living. Um, that is, that is um, for example, it's more expensive to hire a nurse and a medical doctor. It's more expensive to pay rent for um, a medical center or hospitals, okay? But um, even though theory one to some extent is right, um, after adjusting for local price, it still fails to significantly reduce the geographic variation in per patient Medicare expenditures. So theory one is okay, but not enough. Theory two is different hospital amenities. Um, so they might think that um, in different cities, 
hospital amenities are different. In higher spending hospitals, they might devote more resources on the uh, satisfaction of patients. They have better beds, they have better um, rooms. Their patients are more satisfied, even though, um, even if those resources do not contribute directly to health. Okay, so theory two can be right, but after this, they collect surveys from these patients, they find out that there is no higher level of inpatient satisfaction for patients in these high spending regions. So theory two seems like it's not really making the biggest difference between the healthcare spending. Now let's move on to health, uh, theory number three, different medical malpractice environments. This, this is not technology overuse, but it's also a waste of um, medical spending, but in a sense of malpractice environment. Some regions may have a higher chance to sue the doctors or the physicians for their practice. So the, so the um, physicians try to practice more defensive medicines. They prescribe more tests or um, medications to make sure that their patients won't sue them. So this is a waste in some sense, but it's not a technology overuse, okay? Um, so we can still fit that into a, a different health production function um, hypothesis, even though it's still a waste in some form. Um, the doctors find, uh, the researchers find out that um, theory number three doesn't necessarily explain the variation in spending within states because we think of the malpractice environment within states is the same, while it cannot explain the within state um, variation. Okay, here comes theory number four, different health habits. Um, so two states are very similar in medium income education level and urbanization rate. However, people in Nevada are less healthy than those in Utah. Um, okay, so that could explain some of it um, because there is higher rate of infant mortality, liver failure and lung cancer. So um, you need to spend more money in Nevada to achieve the same level of health, okay? Lastly, uh, theory number five, different level of severity of illness. So the spending variation reflects differing levels of illness severity in different regions. Perhaps diabetics in La Crosse are healthier than diabetics in Miami. So Miami's diabetics have to spend more money to achieve the same level of health. So if lower medical expenditure in La, La Crosse results from healthier patients living there, the variation in spending could be justified. However, um, these researchers don't think it's a major source of variation that we observe in the beginning. Okay, so what are the researchers' perspective? They argue that although theory one to theory five makes some sense, but even if you control or combine all of them, they, they still fail to explain the expenditure variation across space. And so that could, that could conclude that there is some level of healthcare waste in expenditure. Okay, here is the researcher's perspective. They think that yes, because of theory one to theory five, there are two healthcare production functions, uh, health production functions for Wisconsin and Florida. Um, they argue that La Crosse is on the line, which means that they use the money wisely and efficiently. There's no waste there, but Miami is not on the line, which means that Miami is wasting money. Okay, they did not achieve the efficient point. So if high expenditure regions such as Miami are indeed spending at suboptimal points or a wasteful point, what causes them to do so? We, um, we think of that as a supply sensitive care moral hazard. 
So this can point to the overuse, overprescription that we think of in the beginning. So supply sensitive care refers to health services who use whose use depends greatly on the supply or availability of that service. Um, an example is that a doctor, if this doctor can easily get an MRI machine, then this doctor will likely prescribe MRI machine uh, technology much more than another doctor who is not as accessible to MRI machines as that. Um, supply sensitive care can also include hospitalization and stays in an intensive care unit. Um, hypothesis here is that doctors with greater access to resource will tend to over prescribe care. And they find an evidence here between number of hospital beds and number of hospital discharges. Okay, so this figure shows the relationship between healthcare use and supply of hospital beds. So technically, um, acute care beds per 1,000 patients should not affect how many patients get admitted to the hospital because people who get admitted because they need to, not because of how much hospital beds are there. Okay, um, this, is this, this is the case for hip fractures. Um, the number of hip fractures hospitalization is independent. Um, we can see that it's a horizontal dot or horizontal line, right? That means it's independent. No matter how many beds you have in this area, um, the incidence of hip fractures in any area is the same. So that's why um, it's not affected by the number of beds that, uh, in that region. However, all the other medical conditions we show here, uh, we show that there is a positive correlation or an increasing line. So that could be um, a very good example that, oh, even though these pe people um, need healthcare, but because there is more availability of beds, there are beds that are empty in the hospital and the hospital tell the physicians that, oh, can you admit a, doc, uh, admit a patient so that we can use our beds? Um, or in some areas, it's, it's the opposite case or they don't have enough beds. So they, some, some patients, even though they need it, they can't get it. That's why there is an increase or increase of hospitalization when, when acute care beds per, ten, uh, per 1K resident increases. Okay. All right, so conclude, to conclude, despite evidence of your overuse, returns of medical technology has been high. We should not discourage technology itself. What we should discu uh, discourage is an overuse or the ways for use of it. Okay, or a supply sensitive, a supply incentive um, technology use. So to differentiate between a good technology use and a bad technology use is very important.